more about writing success. So thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Lauren Moore, and with me is the feisty and fierce Kaylee Williams and her soul sister, Ellen Campbell. We're twins. Twins, yes. Yes, we totally are. At we, 20 books we're identical, I mean. Yeah. Facebook thought we were twins. They kept tagging us as, as each other. Wow. So. Well, see, Facebook knows. Mm -hmm. They know They know who you are. Um, yeah. Tonight, we are... We are brought to you by Edge of Valor by Josh Hayes, He Shirk Medium's own. And this book is on sale this week for 99 cents. You can pick up your copy. And uh, I hear this book is fantastic. Edge of Valor. Uh, we are also starting off a new series on writer writing craft. Hey! Ooh, Sorry. we've got doggies. Doggies entering the show. Dexter? Really? <laughs> she got feisty pups, man. You, you just can't, you can't contain those, those two. <laughs> they were great. They were perfect. They've been perfect since I wore them out after dinner. And now that, you know. I they want to be YouTube famous. Life. Who can yeah. blame them? Yes. It's, it's Dexter and Ripsy. Mostly Dexter. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Right, so we're starting a writing craft series. And today's going to be kind of like the introduction to writing craft, top, craft topics. Uh, what we have coming up. First is Idea Generation with Jason Wynn, then Story Engineering with Larry Brooks. After that, we're going to look at Kill Your Darlings. Should you? Shouldn't you? We hear it all that we ought to, but what do we think with Jason Ansbach and Nick Cole? Who love their darlings. Oh, Nick, will kill him. Nick will kill him in a red hot minute. Uh, I know. I'm, I know. I'm excited for that one. Uh, Pacing with Mal Cooper. Reverse Engineering Your Plot with Clark Chamberlain. Breaking Through Writer's Block with Hank Garner. And then I would like to do a live from 20 books to Vegas episode. Ladies, what do you think? Yeah. Would you that do that live with me? Yeah. If we can figure it out, that's what I think. Let's do it. <laughs> and I, there are so many other topics in writing craft that we would like to do. We've been talking about this, Kayleen, Ellen, and I on our chat. And we would love to bring uh, these to you, the the authors and the editors out there. We would like to talk about action beats, narrative balance, uh, action sequences, fight scenes, characters, all that fun stuff. So if you have an author that you really love, that you think does well with character development or theme development, action scenes, any of this stuff, uh, go ahead, join our Facebook group and let us know and we will find that author, we will hunt them down and we will invite them to the we'll show, try. get them on. <laughs> We'll do our best. Yes, we will. Uh, so tonight we're going to focus on how to engage your, your reader in your story. This is our first job as authors is to connect that reader, to connect with their imagination, to make it come alive, to immerse them in the scene. So we're going to talk about different ways that you can do that in your writing and uh, how you can take your writing to the next level. A lot of you guys, you, you are excellent writers, you're awesome writers, and you're doing a lot of things well, but we want to kind of add to your palette of colors that you can bring to your story by uh, three editors coming on the show, Kaleen, Ellen, and myself, and talking about what we see in, our, in, in writing, in the books that we're reading, and what we can all do better as authors. So uh, ladies, we'll just kind of start with that, that question. How can an author engage the reader's imagination? What do you think? Well, to start with, allow the reader's imagination to work. You don't have to describe every single detail. Your reader can, can visualize a toothbrush or a window or, you know, everyday things. It's a really, really specific window cut out of a tree, that's you know, different. I suppose. But then, but then of course, that's, um, you know, that's, that has to do with the story. You know, like, are you writing a thriller? Um, certain details you're really going to need to focus on, you know, sort of like the, you mentioned a gun in the first chapter, it better go off by the last kind of a thing, so. And don't stop from telling us about the gun to narrate how somebody walked across the room. <laughs> Nobody cares. Nobody cares. You're not adding to your story. You're not driving the plot. You're not enriching your character by explaining how they walk across the room. Just resist the urge and leave it out. What? You're telling me I don't need a note every time someone turns, looks, walks into a room, exits the room, shuts the door? There's... Nope to say it. <laughs> has a heartbeat. Yeah, no, it's it's not necessary to mention every little thing. 
Okay, so we can let the reader's imagination fill in some of the gaps. What are some of the things that we can do to spark the reader's imagination? Uh, definitely word choice. You know, um, certain words are going to evoke different types of emotion. Um, so, you know, if you want them to be creeped out and a little, you know, bleh, you know, those words that you choose um, are really going to impact that emotion behind them. Um, so if it starts coming across, across like goofy, you know, like she bounded like a rabbit across, across the you know, floor, whatever it is, um, you know, that's going to be a little bit more humorous than um, her body snaked across, you know, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, snaked through the room. Yeah, off, off, the, off the cuff prosing here, forgive me. But, um, you know, just, I mean, even those very simple examples create a different uh, a different picture. So, you know, what what kind of picture are you, are you really wanting to paint? And then um, cut out all the walking and the reaching for and the standing up and, and those and then paint everything else, you know. Yes, um, is, is it a dusty room? When they stand up, the dust um, lifted from the chair uh, and the moonlight uh, rippled across her body the nearer she got to the window. You know, I never once said stood. I never once said walked across. But we all generally imagined she stood up, dust was rising, and now she's at a window. So and That was a terrific example. I, I would go a little farther than, than you went, though, and say it's not necessary to describe everything. True. Every object, every setting, every every dim room does not have to be punctuated by dust or flickering firelight. Yep, no, I I completely agree. Yeah, once you really uh, set that scene, don't keep setting it because that's when you're going to get into um, like a clunky prose where they're just like, oh my god, I already know that this is happening. Story, so move the story, move the story. Yeah, Sorry, I just got a pop up on my screen and I'm trying to close it. <laughs> So add in details, just a couple little key details, but don't go overboard. And maybe that's where getting another pair of eyes outside of the text um, of the alpha reader and editor to look at it can help you cut that. But adding in details, looking at your verbs. So your verbs are key. Uh, your verbs can slow down the pacing of your, your story. They might be verbs that don't paint, say a whole lot, that aren't very specific. But on the other hand, your verbs can, they're a big opportunity to paint the picture too. You could say, she, instead of just walking across the room, dash, hop, slide, you know. Ambled. <laughs> Ambled, yeah, all of these words paint a different story than just walked across the room. Right, that's true, but don't let anybody ever tell you never. And there, there's a lot of people believe that you can't use was or is or were or you know any of the basic helping verbs and yeah you you can you really truly can just mix them with other things i mean they're necessary the, the b verbs are necessary they really are yeah i would i would that would be a really hard book to write to never use a was a that or were i'd probably cry <laughs> right that'd be hard on the other hand if that's like your main verb that you're yeah, yeah. If you, I mean, if you, if you're working with like three thousand wases and that's in a fifty thousand word story, you, you cut the bitches down, man. <laughs> they are out of control. That's yeah, they could be missed. They could represent missed opportunities for using a stronger verb yeah. that can do more for your and, story. And, and or, something that I I run into as well is when you're reading the sentence, if you if you can read it without the that or the was, then immediately cut it. You know, it, all it's doing is adding extra extra words that will slow down the reading. Um, you know, so if, if someone says, I don't know, it was just kind of slow through here. You know, maybe start there. Uh, look at all the that's and, and read each sentence and see if that that getting out of there makes it doesn't change it whatsoever. Bleak. That then um, was had all four of those words can be really, really aired back. Yeah. But yes, especially that and had. Yeah, John Bear Ross in the chat, he brings up Hemingway. Hemingway's classically known for his fair prose, for his concise speech, for getting straight to the point. Uh, and just just giving 
just enough details for the reader's mind to kind of fill in the whole story and then moving on. He's also famous for his cats. <laughs> I swear, I didn't make that up. I believe it. Yeah. Um, so, um, sorry, I, <laughs> I need to share my screen. So I, I do want to say, I, in prepping for this show, I was I was telling Lauren, I and and I believe Ellen. Um, I, I feel for every author that we've asked, hey, you know, break down your your process for us. You know, how do you get from A to Z? You know, get, tell us about it. And they stare at us with a blank look like, um, I write words and then I rewrite words. And we're sitting here, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm doing the things I'm doing for, for the edits that we're gonna show. And I'm like, oh shit, I have to break down the fucking editing process <laughs> and my thought process so that what I'm doing can hopefully make sense to you guys and you can hopefully apply it, um, make your words stronger right out of the gate. And I'm just like, clunk, clunk, how do I, how do I show it? God, fuck, okay, so. I just want to say, I, uh, I feel you right here in the heart pieces. <laughs> yeah, what we did for the show is we sat around and we just brainstormed. What does it take to really immerse readers into a story? When we pick up a manuscript and read it for the first time, when are we instantly in love with the manuscript? And when are we asking ourselves, something seems to be missing here. And what is that thing that's missing? And how can we make this manuscript stronger? So we brainstormed that, and then we also asked for samples from the Facebook group, and we got four different samples. So we're going to kind of take a look at them today, and I will uh, share my screen. I share it? Boom. Okay. So here's what we came up with some ideas for how to immerse your reader into your scene. Right from the beginning, the opening should introduce the main character, the setting, which is time and place. Your Introduce the conflict just a little bit. You're not going to give the whole conflict right off the bat, probably. And if there's a theme, you want to kind of hint at it. Um, all this you're just doing slowly and naturally, and we'll show you some ways to do that. You want to have a main yeah. character. What? Go ahead. Oh, I would say in the in the opening, um, that does not necessarily like immersing the reader with conflict does not necessarily have to be your plot conflict. Conflict. If I could talk tonight, um, mm -hmm. it could be a character's initial personal conflict. Um, maybe you're telling kind of like a true story type thing and their mom just died. That would be a huge conflict. But later on, a giant seaweed monster is coming up and she discovers she has magic powers. You know, those are two completely different conflicts. Um, right. But, you know, the um, actual plot story conflict does not necessarily have to be the conflict that you come out of the gate swinging with. You can build that characterization with something else. You don't want to start out your opening scene. She's going grocery shopping. Well, and no, obviously not. <laughs> we're describing each of the spots in the store that she stops at. No conflict whatsoever there. That is not a good way to, to immerse your reader into the scene. They want to connect with your main character. And one of the ways to do that is to have something that your main character is wrestling with and struggling with that the, the reader can relate to. And that can be a, a little touch point that can help them to dive into the story. There has to be a reason why you started there, why the story starts there. And the story wouldn't start there because she just brushed her teeth and went to school because that's nothing. There has to be a reason that the story starts right then. Right. It would be a great that's place if she was poisoned by the toothpaste. Yeah. But I mean, don't, don't get yourself all tense with conflict and what do I, uh, there's a reason you're starting your story here. Give us that reason right away so that we have a reason to stay. Oh, infinite TWJ. <laughs> Oh. All right. Um, I don't think I shared my screen right. <laughs> All right. Okay. Technical problems. So, yeah. But your reader also won't connect with your main character if the main character is someone that's hard to like or someone that's hard to relate to. It can be done. There's some fantastic main characters that, that are not at all uh, empathetic. I think of Scarlett O'Hara from uh, Gone with the Wind. She was kind of a hard person to, to connect with, but she does work as a protagonist. Yes. Still, if your main character is empathetic, makes it easier for your reader to connect with them instantly. Action verbs, we've kind of covered. Having details that 
connect with the senses, particularly sight and sound, including little details here and there. There's also taste, touch, and smell. Those are other ways to connect with your reader's imagination because when they read those words, a sight, a sound, a taste, a touch, they can remember back to a similar experience they've had and that connects with their brain. Uh, if your characters have strong voices and strong personalities, that's another way. Uh, emotion, humor. And, and that's something that you want to shoot for, a, a character yeah. with a, an individual personality. Yeah. I didn't mean to step all over you, just. No. So, so Ellen, how can a, an author come up with a main character that has a strong voice? I don't know how you come up with anything. I mean, I'm, the, I'm, I'm not your fiction writer, I'm your editor. Um, the, the way to give your character a strong voice is to not make them do and say things the way everybody else does and says them. You have to make their conflict real to the reader, whether they agree with it or not, you know. Oh, so-and-so wants a tattoo, but her mother won't let her have one for her. You know, you may not, I mean, her pain is real whether or not you agree with her pain, and uh, you've got to you've got to find the way to get that across, while not alienating your reader, if they happen to be in the mom camp of not liking tattoos. Right. Uh, um, anybody that watched Orange Is the New Black, Pensateki is a perfect example of of a character that's not likable but is compelling and that you love and you want more of. I'm trying to remember which one that was. The the meth girl with the teeth. The guy oh the teeth. yeah, she yeah did not like her towards the end there. Yeah, no, she turned herself around. She was the lovable weirdo. <laughs> but you were interested in her. Yeah, she uh she was she was dynamic in a way. She was all over the place, um, but the more she showed up in the in this in throughout the story, like the more her her needs and wants started to um, focus. Mm -hmm. So it was almost like they're like, hey, here's this crazy wild chick and then we're slowly gonna focus in on her. And at that point you're just like, dude, I'm there for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we were looking for examples of characters that like Scarlett O'Hara that you don't really like, but you really wanna know what's gonna happen to them next. Yeah. Yeah, and some characters, they start out very unlikable, but you see them go through a change by the end and that draws you in too. You want to see this character develop. Maybe even you want to see the main character um, get their comeuppance too before yeah. the end. Uh, that was one of the things yeah. that was so compelling about Scarlett O'Hara is that she never got it. Well, she never made that change. She never, um, her mindset never altered. That's true. She was the same person all the way through yesterday, today, tomorrow. She might be doing it differently today, but she's still the same. Right. Hot mess in the head. Even at the end, when Brett confronts her, she still doesn't get it when he leaves right. her. Oh, well, tomorrow. I'll get him back tomorrow. Yeah. But there's something there's something that compelling, too, about her, her will to survive, doggedness. her will to keep going. Yeah, exactly. Her doggedness. She's going to continue. So I guess main characters can, you know, there could be different things that we can attach to them. They don't necessarily have to have a likable personality, but there's something about them that draws the reader in. They have to be interesting. They have to be interesting. Uh, and and uh, something else, I think it was, um, actually I think it was Michael Anderley that said it. Um, you know, he he gave his, his main character, she really liked, um, oh God, was it Pepsi or Coke? It was one of the, one of the two, Coke. Um, the Coke. And, you know, it's just, it's just some random thing has absolutely nothing to do with anything of the story, but she always wanted Coke and that was her favorite. And, you know, so you could put things in there, you know, kind of like a, what was that one movie? Zombieland. His whole goal was to get a Twinkie. Like that, that's all he wanted was a Twinkie. Um, you know, and you could, you could put random things in there for your characters and it, it, it gives them, um, it makes them a little deeper, a little less cookie cutter because it's something unique to them. So, I mean, if you have six characters, but they're all starting to sound the same, you know, what's something that you can give each character to, you know, make them a little bit different than the next one, you know, just one, um, 
when they start speaking, do you know? Uh, do they usually open long monologues um, that characters have to cut off all the time? Um, is their frame of speech really short? You know, they uh, you know they don't do a lot of what I'm doing. They don't ramble and uh, uh, you know they don't do that kind of stuff. They're just very yes, no, you know, kind of thing. Um, Think about the Golden Girls, four yeah. little old ladies with wildly different personalities. Mm -hmm. You know, and and the the things that they engross in, it's like you're having a conversation, like the, your characters are having a conversation. And um, something that I do notice in a lot of writing is is um, like all the characters um, sometimes will be engrossed in the same conversation. But when you think about it, not every character might be interested in what's being talked about, um, depending on the situation. You know, two characters could be talking, and then a third that you need in the scene to be for whatever happens later. I mean, they could be off doing something else. They don't necessarily have to be in the, so anyway, I'm rambling, but you know, like that sort of, if that made any sense. <laughs> so you're, you can separate out your character's voices in different ways. One way is by the kinds of sentences they use. You can have uh, some characters who have really short sentences, maybe five words only or less. They're just short, concise speakers. You could have others that their thoughts just kind of flow and go. You could have others that have accents. Um, maybe some of the sounds like humor. Huh? Because they'd be, be easy on the accents. Pick, pick like a few words, excuse me, pick like a few words that are like the most noticeable in accents and and and, and go from there. Um, but if you, there's if a you long way. End up turning the entire sentence, you know, into, hey, what's it doing? It's going to be unreadable. They're not going to know what the hell you're talking about. Um, it's going to make it too hard for the reader to understand even remotely what's going on. So that's just my suggestion. With accents. And what it comes down to is it's all for the ease and convenience of the reader. So if the reader doesn't like it, well, the reader is right, whether you think they're right or not, because they're the ones who buy the story. Right. It's just, these are some different ways to engage the reader's imagination, but right. a way to instantly turn off the reader's imagination is if the sentence doesn't make sense, if the sentence is unclear, um, if they're offended. Um, if they have to work too hard to uh, pronounce words, like if, they, if they're reading and they're reading and then they stop and they're like, wait, and it goes on for sentence after sentence of, you know, really difficult words, then... Anyway, sorry, I didn't interrupt you. We can't control how a reader's going to react to your words. No. Um, but I, I was referring back to the dialogue with uh, the. Yeah, as soon there. as their, as soon as their brain goes from enjoying your story and being immersed to it to stopping because I didn't understand what that sentence meant, something like that, that jolts them out of that experience. Um, yeah, anything that knocks them out of the story is something that you want to avoid. Right. Even if it's something as simple as. Did you use the wrong there? I mean, it may not seem like horde and horde being different words, meaning different things is really that big of a deal to anybody but me, but it actually is. There are a lot of people that, that you, you stop and you go, wait, what? And then you're out of the story and you've lost your momentum. You've lost your, and you might get up and go do something else and maybe never come back. So that's why these things matter. Right. Especially if it's a KU reader, right? <laughs> when they're they're still just scrolling by the page, you want to keep them kind of in that book, still scrolling. And any little thing can knock them out, and it could be just yeah, using the wrong bits, using the wrong bear. All right, so let's take a look at one of these samples. Um, I'll should I, Kaylin? Should I let you share your screen? <laughs> uh, yeah, we could do we can do my first one if you want. If you want to, <laughs> here I'll, I'll read guys. So I'll I'll attempt to share my screen again real quick. Boom. Okay. All right. We'll read guys and then we'll talk about it. This is by Guy Anthony DeMarco. As Joe rode towards the exclusive neighborhood, a set of flashing red and blue lights caught his attention. It appeared Boardwalk was blocked off by the Lovecraftville Police Department. Officer Carmack was standing next to the driver's side door with the radio's curly cord running up to the headset next to his mouth. Joe's bike skidded as he pulled up next to the officer. Hiya, Joe, said the officer, tossing the microphone back into the front seat of the squad car. Can't come through here right now, as we got another monster rummaging through someone's backyard. Joe craned his neck, trying to peer over the top of the car. Awesome! What kind is it this time? 
Officer Carmack pointed towards the second house on the right. It's a rare one. I think it's called a Nair at the top. Usual things. Giant teeth, bat wings, a bunch of googly eyes, and lots of creepy tentacles. You can see the top of it. Looking towards where the officer is pointing, Joe spotted the warty and slimy creature destroying someone's trampoline. Wow, never seen one of those before. Nia Lerlothotep? Weird name. The Nia Lothotep flailed several tentacles and shredded the trampoline, tossing pieces into the adjoining yards. All of the different sized eyeballs were rolling around randomly until one spotted Joe. The rest lined up as the monster changed direction and moved towards the fence when it encountered a clothesline filled with underwear and socks. The top portion of the hard creature got tangled in the line and it lashed out, spewing black oily bile on the fence in a lemon tree. The leaves shriveled up and the lemons turned into little black grenades that dropped and exploded, splashing some sort of acid that ate through chunks of the stained wooden coral fence. The monster finally became so ensnared that it lost its balance and fell over, disappearing with a loud popping noise and a heated green cloud that smelled like a backed up toilet at the gas station. Officer Carmack reached his arm into the squad car and toggled the emergency lights off. As the green cloud dissipated, he tasseled Joe's short yet messy brown hair. Well, that's that. Glad to see you got, glad you got to see an unusual one this time. Looks like you're good to go, buddy. Hitting the beach again? The excitement of the appearance of a real Nyarlathotep began to fade. Yes, sir. Looking for some driftwood for an art project at school. Opening the door and sliding behind the wheel, Officer Carmack said, You be careful. There's still a lot of junk that washed up from the last hurricane, so stay away from the sharp stuff. Make sure you're home in time for dinner or your ma will spit in my donuts tomorrow. Joe smiled for the first time today. Nah, she charges extra for that. Bye. All right, ladies. So what do you think? I like it. It's a little rough, but I, I, I genuinely enjoyed it. I know what Kayleen was talking about. I don't have my copy with guys. Wait, yeah, I do. But it's over here. Because I got that like right before showtime. Right, right, right. Yep. That's my bad. You got it down the bottom. Yeah, I think but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the same kind of stuff that I'm always talking about. Um, with, with your as is and your uh, appears. And so I didn't do any edits. I can show you what I would have done to the first. Let's find something. Well, what I like about what he did is kind of right off the bat in the first paragraph, we start to see who the main character is. And we start to get a sense of the setting right from the start. Um, we know his name is Joe. He's kind of an average kid, and that shows up in the way he talks with the, the officer. We get a sense of the setting, so exclusive neighborhood and immediately flashing red and blue lights. We know cops here we know something's going on so we're interested see what comes next i, I love we, how uh, casual these mon the, the, like these monsters are just like oh dude what's up what's going on over there and it's like yeah you can see it over the house it's like giant eyeball tentacle monsters like oh cool yeah so what's going on <laughs> i like yeah yeah it's so ordinary the setting is so ordinary and normal but then there's these monsters it, to me, it reminds me of Harry Dresden and, and Jim Butcher. It just, you've got ordinary Chicago, yet something extraordinary is crashing into the middle of this reality. And it's fun. I like the story because I, I found it fun. I, I like this, the urban fantasy kind of thing. And I, I thought he did a good job of introducing us to the main characters and the setting right off the bat and then showing the conflict right from the red and blue flashing lights. We know something's up with the police officers and then we find out it's more than just crime. It's a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad monster showed up. Yeah. And we were talking about this one a little bit beforehand and uh, we both liked it. We were, we were both excited about it. 
Yeah, this, I can tell you it's good because I'd like to edit it. It's not something I would have to edit or, you know, it's something I would enjoy editing, at least for a while. And we did have a uh, comment in the chat, Silent Wolf, uh, at Keystroke, Ellen has said in the past on Ask the Editor episodes not to accept all editor changes. However, if you feel they completely overhauled your manuscript for the better, shouldn't you accept 99% of the changes? Um, I'd ultimately, I mean, if you feel it's stronger, then accept them. You know, I mean, if, if in your heart you're like, I wouldn't say that, that doesn't make sense for my character, then don't accept it. Ellen? <laughs> I never said don't accept all your editor changes. I said you don't have to accept all of your editor changes. I have, wow. uh, I have more than one client that just accepts all and doesn't even look at what I do. Yeah, uh, I'm not saying that's the way you should be. I'm saying that, you know, it, you need to find a, an editorial relationship like that one where you're that comfortable with it. Yeah. At the end, at the end of the day, yeah, you don't have to, but. Yeah. We're all human. And we are all human. I make mistakes all of the time. The author's human. The editor's human. None of us are God. This we is are. not gospel. This is just an outside opinion. It's a suggestion. So yeah, ultimately it's your book, it's your baby. You're the one who makes the decision, but the editor is coming in uh, with their tools. They're coming in with their experience and they're also coming in with the reader's eye, which uh, I'm writing my, my manuscript and I find it so important to get that outside perspective on my work. I, you know, I need it. I love getting that feedback. But I'm aware that, you know, ultimately this is going to be my name on the front. So I'm the one who's responsible for accepting or rejecting these changes. And with the exception of a few very black and white things, no editor is going to edit. No two editors are going to edit that document exactly the same way. Right. Yep. Yeah. Which is why this episode is so fun. You can get three pers per perspectives if I could talk tonight. <laughs> okay. What else I liked about this this uh, sample that we have is we have some really great verbs that I think work well to, to bring the reader into the scene. Um, he's the bike, especially like that line, Joe's bike skidded as he pulled up next to the officer. Like you get all of that movement in a pretty short sentence. And I, I do like the, um, a set of flashing red and blue lights. I don't you know, like he didn't that. say a cop car with red and flashing blue lights sitting just down the street in front of a blue house. That, yeah, set of flashing red and blue lights. Instantly, there's a cop car in front of him, and he's biking. You see all that. Yeah, see, I would have cut a set out. But you don't. It's not a set of flashing red and blue lights. It's flashing red and blue lights. Boom, con, clutter. This is this is why we love <laughs> Ellen. <That's> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And then when you're looking at the paragraph, if there's a word or a phrase that's just not needed at all for whatever reason, take it out and you'd be surprised at how much better the pose looks at the end. All right, should we look at another sample? Uh, did you want to do mine or do you want to do a different person's thing? Let's do one that you did of nice before and after with. Uh, let's see. So, I mean, I have, I have part of guys in here that I did a before and after, um, or if you want to do one of the other, oh, okay. We'll just, okay. Yeah. All right. So in guys, reason why I have parts of this highlighted. Um, so this is the major action scene that's going on with the Nyar, the Nyar, uh, monster thing. And the parts that are highlighted to me are, are like those major bridges. That's like the kind of like the landmarks of information of what's going on. And then everything else is is supporting that. Um, so then this is what I did, still have those highlighted. Um, the beginning, you know, I changed from the Nyar, the Nyar flailed, um, flailed, uh, God, if I could read it, flailed and shredded the trampoline, tossing pieces into the adjoining yards. I changed to several of the Nyar's tentacles flailed. The trampoline was shredded and pieces were tossed into adjoining yards. Um, reason why I did that, it was just, it was, it was a lot. Like for one sentence, there was a lot going on. Um, and then in the second part, it's different sized eyeballs rolled around randomly instead of we're rolling around ram randomly. It just gets there quicker, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, yeah. And then the rest lined up as the monster changed direction and moved towards the fence end sentence um because the part where he has when it encountered a um 
there is a missed opportunity in in my mind to make that part of the scene really stand out. Um, so a clothesline filled with underwear and socks tangled the top portion of the horrid creature. Um, I flipped that because at first there was so much going on. By the time I got to, it got to the end, I forgot he was tangled and I didn't realize it had died. <laughs> but that's just me. Um, it lashed out spewing black oily bile on the fence and lemon tree. Uh, the leaves shriveled and I took out up because, you know, are they floating? Um, they're obviously already shriveling. It's just kind of like an extra word that you don't need. And the lemons turned into little black grenades that dropped and exploded, splashing in acid that ate through chunks. Um, Cause like some sort of acid, are you not sure of your acid <laughs> in my mind? So N acid uh, stained the wooden coral fence. And this is the part, um, you know, this is the final, the finality of it, of everything that's going on. The monster became so ensnared, it lost its balance and fell over. So I took out finally, I took out that um, because the monster finally became so ensnared that it lost its balance. It, it kind of just adds extra lumps and um, it, it can go goose things up a bit and fell over disappearing with a loud pop. Okay, so you, you finish that out, finish that thought so that they don't lose it. They don't lose the entanglement and the falling over and the popping. And then a feeded green cloud that smelled like a back, backed up toilet as the gas station, as at the gas station filled the area. So then you can then say, you know, the other thing. So that's, yeah. Yeah, as I, I, I would that last bit differently, but yeah. Oh yeah, no, I mean, and then even there, I mean, as I'm reading this, I, I'm already coming up with three different ways that you could have done that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, there's no one wrong way. You can edit a single story exactly. to death, um, but just, yeah, make it, make it its strongest that it can be. Like any editor's creed is, is to not introduce errors. And as long as your editor is not introducing error um, and you like what they're doing, then then that's a good editor or a good editor for you. Because everybody's not good for everybody else. That's true. Right. Hopefully I didn't introduce errors into that as I stare up at Ellen. <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, no, I, I, I'm pretty impressed. You did a really good job. I mean, there was, I would have changed things, some of the things in different, in a different fashion, but it's just because that's the way I would have changed them, not because what you did was wrong. And I think most See? of it was very good. And there we go. See, two completely different editors. They're going to have different viewpoints, which is why getting your, your work on more eyeballs that you can get, you know, if you have friends who like to read, they're going to see things that, you know, someone else might not have. So. I like how you ended that line with pop. Yes. Monster it became so much snared, it lost its balance and fell over, disappearing with a loud pop. Went from popping noise to pop, and, and now you can actually hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. the pop, I mean, you're already stating that it's a sound, you know, so popping noise, you know, you're just, you're kind of, you're over explaining the, the sense, you know, the, the sound sense. Um, so if you can end on that strong note, then do so. And that's why you don't want to stick filled the area and at the end of the next sentence. I, yeah, I put that in there and then it, that's the wrong screen. I would have gone maybe from pop to. The air filled with the scent with, with a, with a green cloud that smelled like a backed up toilet at the gas station. Yeah. So yeah, what what uh, what Ellen just did there? Um, she made the uh, the area around like what's actually happening stronger rather than um, what is in the area. Um, so you can see that before. Not if he gets fixated on uh, one thing at a time. Well, I don't know. I guess I get pretty fixated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could we could overthink it, but I mean. Yeah. I, either way, like my main thing with like this one was that noise was, was so strong that yeah. I really wanted to separate great. those two. That was great. I think, I mean, I'm so proud of you for that. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> but that, that little crack I just made, I was responding to Guy's comment. This one? You'd make a great yeah. editor with all those eyeballs. <laughs> Lots of eyeballs in this scene. All the tentacles. Doing eight manuscripts at once, man. All right. Should we take okay. a sponsor break? 
Oh yeah, we probably should. That would be good. All right, if I could. We do all the things. <laughs> yeah, I've got two more of these bad boys. Okay. Sponsor, why can't? Okay, sorry. I was following your arrow, looking for my arrow. <laughs> God, that's what it is tonight. All right. Tonight is brought to you by Edge of Valor, a military sci-fi thriller, Valor Book One, which everybody is on sale for 99 cents this week. So it's a great deal if you want to snag that up and be immersed in all the amazingness. And as David Weber says, a tour de force, a New York Times bestselling author of Honor Harrington series. When their mission fails, his begins. Special Agent Jackson, Jackson Fisher is a man after truth. When a military operation to extract a high-ranking ambassador from, a, from the war-torn border world of Stonemeyer ends in disaster, Fisher is called in to investigate. A whole platoon went in, but only three Alliance Marines returned, the rest killed in action, along with hundreds of civilians. With tensions between the Hollow Man Alliance and Stonemeyer rising, Fisher attempts to stitch the pieces together. One thing becomes more and more certain. The surviving Marines are lying. As the truth unfurls, Fisher begins to realize this was far more than a simple rescue mission and that the truth might be something best left buried. Filled with action, mystery, and well-crafted characters, Edge of Valor, Valor Series Book One, will pull you into a world of war, conspiracy, and betrayal. It's perfect for fans of David Weber's Honorverse or Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan with a futuristic flair. Also available in Audible, narrated by the award-winning Mark Veter of Doom. Mm. Did that just for for Josh, because I realized uh, I did not say by Josh Hayes. <laughs> because I'm brilliant like that. <laughs> that sounded really good. And John Bear Ross has the force of doom. Well, speaking of John Bear Ross, he also submitted a sample. So I say, let's take a look at his. We also lo loved his a lot, too. Um, I will... Oh, Ellen, do you have you do have it there? Well, I didn't do a lot of markups because um, that's okay. We, don't, we were we'll, so we'll, limited on time. We were so limited on time. I know. We'll read a sample and then we'll talk about it, and it'll be awesome. Okay. But do you happen to have it there? Yeah, I have it right here. Oh, perfect. Okay. I'll add it to the screen. All right, okay. uh, Ellen, would you like to read it for us? <laughs> okay. Jessica Kramer's time at the surplus auctions was not going well. Time after time, other buyers, some in person, others using auction drones to place their bids, had outbid and outspent her. Five CR400 cargo mechs were, were up for auction today at the Third World Third World Gate docks. Four of the heavy framed models went for tens of thousands of credits each, all far beyond her budget. Her hard fought savings of 4,500 4, credits earned in back alley unsanctioned mech fights looked about as sad as the last worn out CR100 unit left on the list. Jessica kept her head down, trying to pass the time as the beings around her jostled and jockeyed to purchase use useless items, including mystery lots of unknown parts that appealed to auction junkies who enjoyed purchasing superfluous garbage. Jessica let the valueless lots pass and focused on the main task at hand. The last mech, her mech, was next. And now, sentience and sapience, the mechanical auctioneer said, we have up for bid the last of our five surplus cargo handling units, another CR400 heavy cargo mech. Condition offered it as is, all sales are final, and all findings by our crack mechanic staff are listed on your auction data inventories. A chuckle built up slowly through the crowd as the throng of experienced and jaded bidders reviewed the list of all the things wrong with the mech. Who's going to go in on that piece of dung? Jessica heard a pair of loud bidders two rows back say to each other. She resisted the impulse to turn and glare at them and waited for the auction to open. We will begin the bidding at 500 credits, the auctioneer said. Do I hear 500? Jessica shot up her hand along with two other beings. A hovering bid drone flashed its bid as well. Ah, uh, well, I see the opening price is right, the auction box said, crooning mechanically in amusement. Do I hear 750? She and the other three parties all signaled in the affirmative. I see 750, let's go 850. Do I hear 850 for this classic mech, which shares its storied design heritage with our own enforcement directorate's rugged MR400, the main defense armor utilized on behalf of our benevolent overlords, the gatekeepers? One of the bidders, a red and blue Shambor, 
failed to raise a flipper for 850 and the subsequent subsequent jump to 950. Jessica felt a rush. She might win this one after all and still be under budget. 950, yes, I see you gentle being there in the front, the auction bot said, motioning to a short, scaly myotian who raised a claw. Let's make it an even thousand. Do I hear 1,000 credits? The hovering drone next to her flashed its lights to bid. Excellent, the auctioneer said. 1,000 credits. Now let's make it interesting. Do I hear 1,500? Jessica winced but put her hand up, along with the myotian in the front. The hovering drone signaled its lights in agreement. On and on the bids climbed through the 2000s, then well into the threes. The myotian dropped out at the 3300 credit price level. Now it was just her and whoever was at the remote end of that drone's controls. 3300, this is getting stupid, she muttered to herself. Her hopes of getting back into the arena, of putting the ugliness of the past five years behind her, hinged on winning this auction. The price was now 3500 and both she and the drone were still in it. She had to think fast. She had an idea. She let the bid count down and she pulled her 20 millimeter revolver from its holster on her chest and popped open the cylinder. Jessica extracted a thick silver colored cartridge from the weapon with her fingertips. A small tone went off from the auctioneer's podium. Pardon us, sentient, but all weapons are to remain holstered during bids per the house rules, the auctioneer bot said, its tone turning cautionary on the verge of a lecture. Jessica felt her face flush as a dozen sets of optics rested on her. She snapped the revolver shut and reholstered it in one quick motion. Just getting adjusted, sorry. I'd like to make the bid 3,800, please, she said, holding her hand up at the price. 3,800 it is, gentle being. Do I hear 4,000? A murmur went through the crowd as the drone signaled 4,000. Yes, well, when it comes to dilapidated machinery, we see there is no accounting for taste, the auction bot said in a droll tone. I see 4,000. Do I dare hear 4,500? Jessica's heart sank. That would tap her fun completely. Still, she raised her hand. And 4,500 credits it is. Do I hear 4,800? The hovering bid drone wavered in midair. Maybe the bastard was just toying with her. Oh, well, time to make her other play. She held the cylindrical cartridge from her revolver in her hand. It was a 20 millimeter EMP kick around meant to disable Borg's bots and other electronic beings once it hit them. 4,800, do I hear 4,800 for this steadfast, steadfast mech chassis? She the bid drone begin to flash. She slammed the EMP round into the bench and the drone dropped in a shower of sparks. The auctioneer bot gave a small tremble, but it was out of the main blast radius of the projectile's electromagnetic overload. Oh, we seem to be encountering technical difficulties with our remote bidder. How unfortunate. The price remains at 4,500 credits. Do I have any other offers? 4,800 credits? No. 47? 46? Any being? No. Jessica glowered at the amused and snickering members of the auctions crowd, silently willing them to keep their manipulators down. Very well, 4,500. 4,500 going once, going twice, the auctioneer bot said, slamming its gavel attachment on the podium. Sold to the human female with the maladjusted sidearm. <laughs> Jessica stood proud and triumphant, slipping the flattened EMP round into her utility jumpsuit's pocket. I'll take it. Nice. I, I really like this one. Why do you well, like it? Um, it's moving. She's she's very relatable because you 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 feel those same emotions she's feeling. You you wanted something in your life that you didn't quite have enough money for, or you might not have enough money for, or you had just enough money for, but it was going to ruin you if you bought it. We've, we've, we've all been there, I think. Well, most people have been there. But things like her heart sank. That is so much better than she turned and looked at the auctioneer hoping that he would, or, you know, whatever. I mean, that's that's great. And gentle being. I, you know, so that, not, yeah, that's definitely like a unique term, clever. you know. It's clever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any being. In fact, I think I wrote a note saying I love that on here. Because I was going to send it back. I didn't do a whole lot of editing on this one, like I said, because I ran out of time. Yeah, I don't remember what I'm doing from. Well, I was going to write that if I didn't. Apparently, I did not. Well, one of the topics we wanted to talk about is narrative violence. The idea that. As a writer, you want to have action sentences, you want to have description sentences, but you also want to have internal reflections. Mm -hmm. And 
mix up those kinds of sentences and not just stick to all action and all dialogue or all internal reflection on, on the other hand and description, but, but balance those elements together. And one thing I like about this story is that you have those different kinds of sentences all working together. Just like you said, that one sentence about her, her heart sank, he chose to use that sentence there instead of another action beat to talk about what people are saying or doing. Um, but but also to say what's going on in, in her head too. There we go. <laughs> you got it. Yes, I had because I had pulled up guys, remember? Woo so yes, I will send this to you, John. Um, if you give me your email address so you can take a look at the things that I did. So Ellen, go ahead and walk us through what you did. Since it's all right here. I just smoothed it out a little bit. Because I mean I know it's surplus auctions, the title of of the event that she's at is surplus auctions, but I eliminated the article here just for a sentence flow instead of saying at the surf at, at the surplus auctions. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It just hit me for some reason. Uh, here we had purchase being used repetitively. So I changed. Jessica kept her head down, trying to pass the time as the beings around her jostled and jockeyed to bid on instead of saying purchase. I put it. I changed that to bid on. All right, so if you, see a word, nice. if you see a word being reused a lot, you'll want to replace that word with a different word. Find another way to say it. Yeah, absolutely. That's one thing you're doing. And the other thing you're doing is you're cutting out words that are not adding to the story. Yes, or are incorrect. Because, I mean, there were, there were a few, you know, just like te technical things that I did. See? See how much I appreciated that? I said something nice. <laughs> uh, here I... Uh, cut out some filtering and right, explain what, what filtering is. Okay. Filtering is when you stick something in that puts a layer between you and the reader or between the reader and, and, and the character. So for you want your characters to be so compelling to the reader that the reader feels like they're right there with them. But when you say Jessica heard, then you, you've just kicked the reader back a step by telling him, Oh, she heard this, so that's what's going on now. There you go. Very nice. Instead of saying, instead of just telling what she heard, right. does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So instead of saying, saying Jessica saw the airplane fall and heard a crash, you just say the airplane. Yeah. I mean, with, with an event crashed. like that, you can the reader's going to assume that if Jessica is present, Jessica is aware of these things happening. Because why wouldn't she be? You don't need to tell us that she's aware. And then I re rephrased because on the first one it said that the that the pair of noisy bidders said to each other, "Who's going to go on on that piece of dung?" A pair of loud bidders said to each other. Well, I, I changed it to a pair of loud bidders two rows back. One of a pair of said to the other instead of the two said the same thing. Right. Do um technical if, if it's under a thousand you spell it out unless it's a MR four hundred gentle being I just love that that tickled me yeah yeah no, the, the the word choice where the the bot who's doing leading the bidding he's got a particular voice he uses particular expressions particular words it, <laughs> he's a little more formal it's kind of cute it's endearing I think. He's got personality. I, yeah, I, I, I perceived him as a little sarcastic. Yeah, sarcastic, but also kind of like in an uptight kind of way. But he makes Brit, he makes Jessica sound even more informal and more uh, spontaneous in contrast. Yeah. To main characters, actually, they're kind of at the heart of the conflict in the scene with the spitting war that's happening. Yeah. And, and I think she feels very in conflict with the with the uh, bitter bot. The the uh, the auctioneer bot is just kind of incidental. And I, I also want to add, so you know, it opens up with this with this. They're at she's at this bidding place. Uh, we know she's you know probably shouldn't be bidding, but we don't know why. Like we don't know why until like halfway through that you know she needs this to fix something in her past. So you have all this buildup kind of like getting into the throngs of, of the bidding. And then it's like, oh, shit, 
the oh man girl get it get it win it you know it's like it's like that kind of thing you know you're the initial conflict is you know she's there bidding and she wants to win it and now she's bidding with this stupid robot and whoever's on the other end of it um, and the and fact that the, the the bots kind of put down her mech suit that she's bidding on, they kind of insult it. That puts the reader more on her side for her winning it because we want to, we were in it with her. I think she mentioned right at the top that it was, she's she's bidding on a mech suit for her, right? Yeah, but uh, we we don't know why. Like, it's not right. until, like, towards the middle that, you know, there's... We don't uh, know if the driver or putting the ugliness of the past five years behind her, you know. It's like, ooh, what ugliness? It just adds that another that extra layer right yeah, yeah. in the middle of this bid war. So. Right. So our conflict is about this piece that she's bidding on, but the conflict is multi-layered. She's got her personal reason, she's got her internal motivation for it, but it's also her trying to get the auctioneer to, you know, to let her to win this and her versus this other bot who's also bidding on it. So these different layers keep on building on the conflict. And, well, it's and, and the conflict one. shifts to, to this, this, uh, this auction patron and that bidder and that bidder and that bidder, you know, who, who her conflict is with changes as, as the auction goes on. Because at first, yeah. Cause at first I, she's not really at odds with, with the auctioneer, except for the whole situation makes her nervous. And first, it was her and the what's his name? I'm sorry. Da, 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 da. The, the, we had a claw. He bid with a claw. Oh, the guy down in front with the claw. Yeah. 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 And then the bid drone. And then there was another. This, okay. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. So it's building the she's winning sort of a thing. And like you start rooting for her because the bid's getting right. higher. Well, but, and she's getting more nervous, you know. So. But you're getting more nervous for her because there are more bidders interested. So, I mean. There, there are more forces arrayed against her, kind of. Right. And she's the only human in the whole room. Well, we don't know. Else is a bot. Well, and but for for what for the for the people painted, I mean, a reader could imagine more humans. You know, he picked out very simple descriptions. You know, for these other alien types. So in your mind, you can just create up all these crazy things. You know, like a freaking Farscape episode. If the, um, if the cantina scene in Star Wars was an auction. Yep, yep. And, you know, and also, like, people think, oh, action scene, I need to have all this stuff going on. This is a great action scene. This is a wonderful it's, scene. It is a very simple, um, well-thought-out action scene because it has tension. Mm -hmm. it, it has a goal. It has risk, you know, and those things don't need to be life-threatening. They just need to be delivered in a way that is compelling. Right. And having these different elements to the one conflict helps to build that. So most of whereas, what I did, I'm sorry. Whereas if we had all of a sudden other conflicts that are coming in and distracting the reader from the central one, uh, then that would diminish from when he's trying to build in this one scene. And that reminds me. Right, where'd it go? Blah, 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 blah. She needed. She might remember. So, yeah. that. Uh, John Barry Watt, Ross, the lovely writer of this, says she is a fun, conflicted character to write. She definitely sounds fun. Um, and Guy Anthony DeMarco says you get a good sense of her moral grayness because she's willing to cheat a bit. You know, and that was a very subtle, you know, uh, a character trait that he slid in there, you know, her very casually taking out this bullet and then, you know, knocking out the bot that's getting the bit up a little too high. <laughs> right. But that's what makes her essential. Yep. The other characters might be. She's not perfect. <laughs> she does shit to get what she wants, you know, and that can make an interesting character. Just small, very small things like that. It doesn't have to be earth shattering. Right here, it said um, she had an idea. She had to think fast. She had an idea. That That's not, it's a little bit stronger with she got an idea because now it's something that's happening, not something that happened. You don't want to repeat the had. She had to think fast. She had an idea. It, it just right. kind of yeah, especially because that sentence is, is a key one for this whole scene. It's a turning point for the scene. Before 
she's in this bidding war and she's it, the bids are going up, 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 and it seems like it's going to go too high for her. So the, the conflict looks like she's going to lose it. But then at that point, with that one sentence, that's a turning point, And now she's going to have a chance of actually winning it. So that line is very important. And it, it signals you to you that um, she's clever. She's got, uh, she's not without mental resources. That's true. So it's characterization. It's building on her and we're getting to know her. Anthony DeMarco says, shows the importance of winning this bid adds to the tension. It's certainly important to her, which is what matters. So otherwise, I just, I did a lot of what Kayleen did, taking out things that were uh, unnecessary. Um, I, I wish I'd done it in line like Kayleen did, but I just didn't even think about it. I I, no, see, you freaking went through the whole thing. I took snippets out of it and then like focused on very, very specific reasoning for. But you did a really good job, and you were able to say, "I did this because of that, and this because of that." And I'm here, like, well, yeah, this is kind of a mess, so I cut this out, and now it's better. So. Haley, do you have any more befores and afters to show us? Um, I do. I have one from Jay Clifton Slater. Let's see. Uh, for this one, you'll see uh, my highlights are on that very first sentence and something in the middle towards the end. So it reads, the stream gurgled over rocks in a rhythmic pattern, distorting the musical sound, the horse lapped up water, and the mule whinnied while munching on the tendered shoots growing next to the creek. Ilario Cicera stretched and gazed up through the branches at a few visible stars and Luna's glow. Closing his eyes, he willed his body to relax in hopes of going back to sleep. So there is nothing like inherently wrong with with this opening, um, but it could definitely use a little bit of tightening. So what I did here was like an extremely minim minimalistic change. Um, you know, distorting the musical sound, a horse lapped up the water, um, you know, because we don't know who this horse is. It's, it's just some random horse. I mean... It's not an important horse. It's not the horse that we know. Um, and a mule whinnied, munching on tender shoots growing next to the, tr the creek. Um, so that's what I did there. And, you know, we this part here, um, I, I like the idea of it, um, but it, it could be a little stronger. So the stream gurgled over rocks in a rhythmic, rhythmic pattern. It paints a really nice picture. But in when I found, I'm going to skip that one. When I found um, Luna's glow, I was like, that was it. Anyway, so then uh, bringing back a stronger opening, the rhythmic pattern of a stream gurgled over rocks. Um, essentially, I'm trying to add in that sense of sound. Um, bef b oh God, how do I even describe that? Uh, I, I'm trying to clean up what the sound is. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go to my last one. Okay, so this is what I ended up with. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm all over the place. Okay, Luna's glow highlighted the stream rushing over rocks in a rhythmic pattern. The reason why I changed it that uh Luna's glow, we know it's 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 evening, it's dusk, it's night. Before we had no idea um what was even going on as far as that, since it was important with the character laying there at the end of this paragraph, I put it at the beginning. Um, and rushing over rocks. There's a lot of different words you could use there. I just used rushing because it kind of felt like it was a more quicker moving stream since it's gurgling. But gurgling is um, kind of a heavy word. You know, it's supposed to be a pretty musical rhythmic and gurgle like, rah, 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 rah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not a pretty sound. Um, a horse lapped, lapped the water, distorting the musical sound. So with there, I just cleaned up the fact that um, what the horse is doing. Um, the wet grind of a mule munching on the tender shoots growing near broke the trance entirely. So um, I could I could definitely clean this up more, but uh, essentially I painted the picture at the beginning, um, brought in these animals, and then uh, breaking the trance is what's bringing you into the character being awake because it gives it a reason. Like maybe it's the damn mule who woke him up. Um, and gazed up through long branches at a few visible stars. I changed long, I changed the to long um, because the branches 
like is it a bush is it is it like i don't know it just mm -hmm. it made a it made a flat um image in my mind i wasn't sure what exactly was happening um closing his eyes he willed his body to relax in hopes of going back to sleep so ellen dissect my dissection because i can tell oh. you're burning oh no huh? i just <laughs> well just some things aggravate me more than other things i i like i this. do that a lot i do that a lot to her guys i'm not gonna lie she yells at me really I good do she I do does yell at her. i'm brutal i think i made her cry once okay we're gonna she actually made me cry happy tears. She cursed in the comments because she was so happy I wrote something the way I wrote it. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. Do you want to switch documents, Lauren? Oh, I'll do that. Or, okay. Are we going right. to? Oh, there we go. Okay, Jay Clifton Slater. Now you're I getting the Ellen, lot, the lot, Ellen lot treatment. For you. Instead of making the changes, a lot, a lot of comments. We're going to start with... Uh, we're gonna ignore the rocks that are laid out in a pattern in your sentence and move on to horses don't lack water. And from there, we're gonna go on to uh, mules do not whinny, they bray. Oh, that, that's why I can't open it because I'm on the wrong one. Okay. Yeah, I. that seemed odd to me. Uh, a mule whinnied while munching. Um, so I took out whinnied because- Yeah. It seems strange. And they don't just do it for no reason. They don't sit around whinnying or braying or horses and, and, and they just don't. Equines don't behave in that fashion. So at any rate, I made a few comments. I will send this back to you as well so that you can take a look at it. But I tried to explain what I thought when I saw it as I was going through. Uh, this was one of my favorites. The Legion officer rolled from under his blanket. How exactly does that work? A blanket is light. It's kind of hanging on you. So I pointed out some. I pointed that out. Probably maybe I could have been nicer about that. Um, and then offered an alternate. An alternate so you can actually compare side by side. What you wrote and, and my suggestion. The Legion officer rolled from under his blanket. Continuing to rotate, he moved beyond the circle of firelight and came up, up upon a knee. Um, where, and I wrote, in one swift and silent movement, the Legion officer cast his blanket aside and rolled outside the circle of firelight, coming up on a knee. Mm -hmm. Because, I, I mean, I just can't even visualize it. And that's, that's red because you typoed that. <clears throat> he had containing. Continuing to rotate. I mean, I'm not, what, what is, that, that's not a natural follow through for somebody to read <clears throat> you've got the did he continued to roll or he somersaulted or i mean i just kind of so you can take those yeah. two sentences and rewrite them so it's just one that gets across the action beat and then mm -hmm. it just it just flows it's a little smoother yeah yeah so so where in the first one that we had splitting the prose because it was such a long sentence and there was so much action going on um, made it flow a little faster, a little easier. In this case, because it's such a, con a single continuing movement, there's not other things adding onto it. Um, making that one solid continuing sentence is, you know, what's yeah. going to help strengthen it. Condense, rephrase, and yeah, make it flow. Like the water in the stream. That's perfect. Yeah, right here when you're when you were talking about the knives. Um, a black hilted dagger marked by a yellow strip. Why? What? What is the significance of the strip? I suggest I, I said that it's pretty vague, and I'd either elaborate on that or delete. I mean, where on the knife is the strip? What is the, why is the detail significant enough to interrupt an action scene to tell me that there's a yellow strip on this knife? I mean, what? It's either vitally important to the story that I need, that I need to know it immediately, or it's just kind of random and taking up space. So, and I don't know which, I have no way, no way to tell. Unless the reader needs to know it now, then just. Yeah. 
And nope, can't do it from here. Ellen. And it's just, you know, a lot more smoothing out. Um, there were, here we go. Hi, Anthony DeMarco. He agrees with you. He says, you're not paid to be nice, Ellen. Haha. <laughs> the big old smiley face. I was only pretending like I cared. <laughs> we know the truth, yeah. Ellen. We know that you love us. Yes, I do. She cuts us gently. Um, okay. and, I, and I try to, yeah. Right here, in any attack, commitment provides forward momentum. Well, it doesn't provide forward momentum, really. I, I didn't think that provide was the best choice. I offered you like five more that I thought were better. And they are all better than provides. So you have a selection now. Lots of choices. Okay, no, here we go. Here, here is the my biggest problem with, with, with the story. And the story has all the potential in the world. You start out, you name him, Alario Cicera, and that's great. And he's a Legion officer, okay, that's fine too. And then you could you dig into the story, referring to him as Alario, and that's fine. And then, bang, Centurion Cicera. Wait, what? Yep. Where did the Centurion stop. come from? The reader has to stop and think, wait, is that, wait, what? And then when we got into the attack going on, do, 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 do. Uh, confusing descriptions. It uh, offered some confusing description. Where we go? Now it's back to being a Larry again. Robbers. He hurtled the archer and sprinted at the pair of robbers. He was two steps toward the men when on when on when the tribesmen on the left folded up around an arrow in his thigh. Tribesmen. Where, where did what, what tribesmen? We have our centurion, and we have these robbers. What? Who is the tri, tribesman? First target out of the fight. Blah 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 blah. And then the legion officer. You were, you went from referring to him as Alario to referring to him as the legion officer. It's just. I mean, I understand that you don't want to repeat his name over and over again. Um, I would suggest re, rephrasing entirely or using pronouns because it's just. You don't want your reader to have to stop and think. What, who, wait, who is this? What tribesman, um, ba, 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 the robber. You called him something else too, I think. The traveler. Yeah, Alario is the legion officer, the centurion, the traveler, Alario. Centurion. So too many names, it makes it confusing for the reader to follow uh, and figure out who who's doing what. Especially, um, you know, it's technically this is a very short, like, span of words. And that's, what, four or five different, essentially, like, names for this one person. Yeah. Um, and I have to stop yeah. and make sure that, that, that you're talking about the same guy every time. Because I'm, wait, wait, wait. It's just kind of a wait what moment. And that's, and that's something you don't want to do to your reader. Right. You want to make it absolutely clear that the reader... So the reader doesn't have to stop and figure out what's going on because when right. they're doing that, they're not enjoying the story. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you don't want to be re too repetitive. That could be one reason why um, an author might want to find a different name for someone. Um, don't write your way around it. You don't have to name. If you're talking about the same person, there is no reason in the world that you have to refer to them by name 15 times on a page. It's just not necessary. Write what's going on. Don't write what they're thinking about it. Don't write what they're looking at. That. Don't write that they're walking by it. Tell me what's happening. Don't tell me what they're doing about what's happening, unless that's germane to the story. <clears throat> but to do to do this here, this many names, this many monikers or appellations or whatever, in in two pages and five hundred words, and I I was genuinely confused. I mean, I'm not just saying. It's confusing because I'm I'm like that. I, I was genuinely confused. They're like, wait, who is what tribesman? What tribesman? I didn't get it. Mm. I had to. I went back and made sure I didn't miss something. Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing with the start of the story, Kayleen. When you're first 
reading about the horse and the mule, I think he used the word the horse and the mule because in this character's mind, it's it's his. He knows which which one, but the reader doesn't know that yet. Yeah, and that is, yeah, really good point. I mean, for, it's not written first person, you know, so it's not like, you know, the horse over there. It's it's a horse, you know, the, the, the narrator is depicting what's going on with all the characters. Um, and it just, it felt, I mean, it's, it's the first introduction into the story. We don't know anything that's going on. We don't know anybody that's it's going on with the horse, the mule. Is it a, is this about a horse and a mule? Are those the main characters? It's kind of what it felt like to me. So that's why changing the, the to, uh, that's why I did that. Yeah. I think, I think I might keep, go ahead. Try to re resist embellishing with details about some subjects that you you're not really strong on i mean <clears throat> i'm not saying <clears throat> excuse me never write about a horse or a mule i'm saying don't uh, don't fluff up your story if to somebody that 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 knows horses and mules this is as, as a glock with an external safety so if, if you if if it just sounds it sounded good and that's why you wrote it, maybe just leave those details out because what if you got them horribly, horribly wrong? Well, I think I know why it, my theory about why it's in there is my favorite sentence is out of tune with the natural sounds a stick snapped. I love that sentence. You haven't mentioned it, but I just love that sentence. The paragraph opening it up, we are, we're kind of like lulled, we're getting the sense of, the nature all around and it's peaceful and everything's beautiful. And then all of a sudden a stick snapped, right? Da, 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 and oh, the dude. mood changes and that, that's going to introduce us to the conflict that's coming. The bad guys are coming. We're going to have an action scene and that's exciting. Uh, so I, I think in that first paragraph, he's trying to create, you know, all the, the peaceful <laughs> sounds and noises. And there's a way to do that. And there's a way to do that without going with it. Use, use details that you know. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, I don't know how else to say it. <clears throat> I would not presume to ever discuss how a bomb is put together or, um, well, yeah, I could tell you which way the carburetor bolted on. Um, I mean, there, there are a zillion things that I wouldn't even presume to, to, offer detail on, I mean, that I know exist, that I'm comfortable with referring to them as existing, but that I would never ever embellish because I don't want to get it wrong. Hmm. Which is why you research. Or leave it out. Yeah, or leave it out. Yeah, like, don't if it's really important for that mule to say something, yeah. what does a mule sound like? Go to YouTube, mule talking what does a mule say what does the mule say but you look at this scene you look at this paragraph you take out that little no bit. i understand what he's doing still, and yeah it's still it's still a beautiful paragraph without it that's the point i'm trying to make okay it's, you know, these little details that we add in um that maybe are beyond us like for me with bomb making where with the carburetor that would be beyond me or maybe even the glock and stuff okay but i can take those little pieces out and the rest of the scene, the rest of the paragraph still holds without it. I get agitated when I think something is worth saving. So that's. She's that being time. hard cause she likes it. She sees yeah. its potential its yeah. juices flowing. Yeah. Blood pressure rising. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So we've covered a whole lot of topics tonight. Uh, we've talked about how right from the beginning you want to have a character that's interesting, a character that connects with the, the audience. You can do that by having strong character voices. You can do that by incorporating humor, by making your character's voices unique, by including sensory details, by your verb choice, but also by cutting things out. It's funny how much you can cut out. Uh, it's surprising. And how much stronger your prose gets when you trim out as much as you possibly can. All of these are lots of different ways to connect with the audience's imagination and to make that scene come to life. 
Um, and clarity is king. Yes. Anything else you ladies would like to add? Um, can I do my last one? That one was the not info dumping. Oh, go for it. Def yeah, that's an important. Okay, thing so for I'm gonna. I'm just gonna because I know we're way over time. So I'm just gonna jump straight to the end of all my changes. Um, so this was by Bill Frisbee, um, right in the middle of his submission, and he's introducing essentially a new character from uh, the main character that was going on. And goes, we have problems. Freya's voice cut through the syrup of his thoughts and fears. So I took out the said because Freya's voice said. Okay, well, her voice is already going. She doesn't need to say it since there's an action after. So cut that up. Um, and he had in here, she was his internal assistant or IA, a half biological, half mechanical artificial intelligence implanted in his skull. It's a lot of information in a very um, quick scene. You know, it's something that can be woven in a little bit later. Um, so of his thoughts and fears, her voice gave him something to latch onto and focus on. You know, that's that's like the core essence of what she is to him. You wanna get that in as soon as possible. You know, and then you can add in his internal assistant or IA became a life preserver to his drowning in a dark ocean. I really liked that drowning in a dark ocean part. Um, and then he knew there was a problem, but he wasn't alone anymore. I cut that out. Um, because that's what you are already painting. You know, you're already painting that there's a problem and you're already painting that he's alone in this pod thing that he's in. There is good news and bad news. Um, so yeah, so I just, I really wanted to address that because, you know, we, we want to like put in so much so that our readers aren't confused. And sometimes um, we can lose what, what the most important bits are. So since this this IA is literally implanted in his skull, it's almost like an extension of himself, but it still has its own personality. Um, it can act beyond him, at least think beyond him. So some of this other information is just kind of bogging down the importance of what she is to him and what she does for him because that other stuff can be introduced later. Right. It looks like you're saying the same information just in half the words. Yes. You're straight to the point. You're cutting what the story, what the reader doesn't need to know right now. You're also trimming out the fat words that are not adding anything to the story. And you're taking out uh, whatever is redundant, like that second to last line. You knew there was a problem, but he wasn't alone anymore. That's already implied by what's happening in the paragraph. So you can take that line out. And it just makes the whole paragraph that much stronger. Yeah, absolutely. Give them a reason to care about the about the information that, that uh, you're kind of bogging them down with. Give us the and, action. And, and to add uh, to what we were just discussing um, with like the names and everything, like all the names. So we've, she's already been named Freya, her voice, his internal assistant or IA. So there's three different renditions of her in one single paragraph however it's 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 of a single how oh god how do i explain this it's of a single instant sort of from his third person perspective if that makes sense um so you're claiming that it is something of his and now we know her voice or her name and what she is to him so that's why, because I know there's someone out there asking, probably going to wonder, but you said three different things there when you said before. Um, that's why in this instance, it, it strengthens it because instead of explaining what she is, it's woven into the narrative without being here reader. This is the information it's woven into the narrative and continuing the action. Okay. So take, if that made any sense at all. Take information from an info dump and see how you can uh, take the key piece and incorporate it as a detail or incorporate it as part of the action uh, mm -hmm. rather than having a separate chunk of the paragraph that's dedicated to conveying that information. Yeah, because in, in, in the first in the first rendition of it, um, you know, we have in we have a dialogue and who said that dialogue, and then we have you know, four different sentences of what this new character is, what they're about, what they're for, what it does, who it is to him. 
and then we finish with dialogue. And it's, it's a lot of extra words in between we have problems. You can, you can lose that initial, oh shit, what problems? If yeah, you don't get to the rest of it sooner. The immediacy is lost. Yeah. Um, you use focus six times in this two pages. But I do want to say I really liked Hope or a Train. I liked that a lot. I even italicized it for you in one spot. Um, and contractions, lack of contractions. But yeah, Kayleen in the info dump, I mean, that's huge. That's just huge. And this one, and that one is an easy one to move because the guy's going to be in the hospital later anyway, right? Unless you kill him right there. <laughs> so, either way, that was a fun character. Right there. All right. Well, to all our podcast listeners, we apologize at the end of the episode that we love you all. We do this because we love you. And but so much of the show has been visual. Uh, on the on the YouTube channel, we have the yeah, word document popped up with the the comments and the track changes. So you can you can see it. So if you're curious about that, you can find that on our YouTube show uh, podcast listeners. Thank you for hanging in there with us. Yeah. And also thank you to Edge of Valor, written by our very own Josh Hayes, for sponsoring us tonight so that we can continue doing amazing shows like this for you. Um, thank you for hanging on for that extra half hour also. Um, there's just, oh God, there's so much that we could keep talking about, um, keep going into uh, this sort of thing definitely can't be done in an hour, but we wanted to try and jam in as much as we possibly could and do it in a way that what we were essentially editing and picking on, you can hopefully apply to your own work. And when you do submit to an editor, you know, it'll make that work just that stronger. And then you'll come out with an even stronger finishing because it can only be as strong as what you initially send in. Um, so for Lauren Moore, I'm Kayleen Williams. This has been The Writer's Journey. Be sure to come back next week. We're going to talk about some reading, writing, and everything in between right here on Keystroke Mediums, The Writer's Journey. Good night, you guys. Night. Bye.